In this video, I'm going to introduce the English consonants, go over their production as well as their transcription. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the place of articulation. And this is going to be a very brief slide because we'll go over the places individually for each of the sounds we cover, but just to give you a general idea of what these terms mean and what it looks like in your mouth. The first term is bilabial. Now, I really want to break up the words into what they mean to have a better intuitive understanding. So bilabial literally just means two lips. So these would be sounds made with your two lips. And if you take a look at the diagram, this would be this spot right here. Labiodental, well, if we take labial to mean lip, then labial means lip, and dental would mean teeth. So this labiodental sound would be when your lower lip is touching your top tooth, as in something like f, as in few, or in very. You have your lower lip touching your top teeth. Interdental, well, interdental, inter means between, and dental means teeth. So this is between the teeth. So when I talked about the words thought and though, those two sounds are made in between your teeth. Alveolar talks about something called the alveolar ridge. And I'm going to circle this on the diagram in red. So it's this little hard bump right behind your teeth. So if you put your tongue behind your teeth, and just push it backwards until you start to dip upwards. It's that little hard ridge right before the upward dip. And that's your alveolar ridge. So these are sounds made there, and you might feel it more if you make a sound like tooth, that t in tooth. Your tongue is touching your alveolar ridge when you make the word tooth, or doom, or simple, or zeal. So the T, D, S, and Z are all made at the alveolar ridge. Alveol palatal is made just a little bit behind the ridge. And I'm going to erase this circle here, and the alveol palatal would be a little bit behind it, so on that dip. So a sound like sh, as in ship. If you feel a s and sh, s and sh, you can feel there's a difference in how forward you are. S as in sip is on the alveolar ridge, while sh as in ship is a little bit behind it. A palatal sound, uh, there's only one sound in English that uses a palatal, that would be the y. It's a little bit harder to feel, but essentially the palatal sound would be kind of a little bit further back from alveopalatal. Uh, velar is where your velum is, so I will circle this one in purple. So this is where you make sounds like k as in king, or g as in go. And finally, glottal is made all the way in the vocal folds. So in a word like help, that H in help is a glottal sound. So these are the places of articulation. But what's really more important when learning sounds are the manners of articulation. So every sound has a place and a manner and a voice. So manners are the different types of sound and this is what the airflow is essentially doing. So for instance with stops, Airflow in the oral cavity is stopped. And just to take a look at this, the oral cavity, this means somewhere when air is trying to escape out of your mouth, it is held at some point and then it can escape. So for instance, p and b as in pill and bill. Okay, these are bilabial sounds. So here the airflow is stopped right behind your two front lips, p and b, and then it's released, and that makes the p and b sound. With talk and dock, the t and the d, these are your alveolar sounds. So this is airflow is held right behind the alveolar ridge. T and d is released. T and d. K and g, as in king and go, these are your velar stops. So you have airflow being held right behind the velum, and then it's released, king, go. And the last one is called a glottal stop, and this one is very hard to hear, but in a word like uh-oh, uh-oh, it's in between the uh and the o, oh, uh-oh. It kind of sounds like nothing. Uh, another word in your dialect, this isn't true for all speakers of English, but in a word like 
kitten, kitten, you might have a glottal stop there. Some people say kitten, some people say kitten, and other people say kitten with the glottal stop. Now, it's important to note here, with the PBTDKG, eh, these are all the same letters that we use in our spelling, but when we write the symbols for uh-oh, this symbol is the glottal stop symbol. If you make any alterations to it, it may be a different sound, so make sure you're writing them exactly as they are. But okay, these are all the stops in English. These are all the oral stops, the stops that go through the oral cavity. And they all kind of have that similar quality where air is kept behind the part of your mouth, then it's released. P, b, k, g, t, d, a. You can definitely feel there's the similar quality between all of these sounds. Now, fricatives aren't stops, so airflow is continuous, but it's turbulent. So, for instance, in feel and very, airflow can get out of your mouth continuously, but it's very, very tight. There's a very small space where air can go. So feel and very, these are labiodentals. So this means that your bottom lip and your top tooth are made in the sound production. Feel very. In sick and zoo, so s and z, these are your alveolar fricatives. So this is the same place as your T and your D. So talk, doc, sick, zoo. They're all made in the same spot. Now we're going to go into some symbols that you might not have seen. The first one is esh for the sh sound, like in ship. So this corresponds to the sh in our letters. So the sound is sh, ship. And the other symbol, ej, would be a j. So this is the counterpart to sh with some vocal vibrations, j. So measure, j. And these are alveopalatal, meaning that these are just made behind the alveolar ridge. So s, sh, s, sh, z, 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 z. You can hear the difference between them, and you can feel the difference. Think and though, we covered these in the last video, but once again, uh, these are interdentals, so these are in between your teeth, your tongue goes in between your teeth to make them, and these correspond to the TH sounds in think and though, so these are different. Think is voiceless, it doesn't have any vibrations in your throat, but though is voiced, it has some vibrations in your vocal folds. The last fricative is the H in high. And this is a glottal fricative. So the glottal stop in uh, oh, and the glottal fricative as in high. So these are fricatives. Turbulent airflow, meaning there's this very, very, very narrow passage that air can continuously flow through. Sh, zh, s, z. You can feel that very tight constriction. They're also pretty noisy sounds. Affricates are a combination of a stop and a fricative. They're co-articulated, so that word just means they both occur at the same time, and usually with affricates, the two sounds have to be very close together. English has four. We have a ch as in chip, and we have a j as in jump. So if we think about t, sh, so these are just the symbols for t and sh, but we're doing them at the same time. So instead of t, sh, t, sh, we do them together, ch, ch and then we put a tie bar around them to signal that it's at the same time. Similar with de and je, instead of doing de je, de je, we do it at the same time, je, je. The other two we have in English are ts and z, as in gets and leads. Now these are affricates and they only occur at the ends of words in English, but you can tell by just how quick they're pronounced after each other. Compare, say, KS in a word like leaks. This is not an affricate. It is not an affricate. Leaks. But x, x. There's some delay between the k and the s. Compare with ts, ts. It's immediate. So we have that affricate ts and z. Nasals. So nasals are stops. However, instead of the airflow being released from your oral cavity out of your mouth, air is just continuously redirected up through the nasal cavity. So mm as in match or mm as in nice. 
or even ng as in sing, ng. Airflow is being stopped in your mouth, but the air is actually going through your nose to escape. So these are nasals. Why? Because they go through your nose, so they're nasals. And there are only three in English. Uh, sometimes, depending on the word, you may have a third variant or a fourth variant that looks like mm, so mm. It's hard to hear the difference between mm and mm, but this would be uh, the symbol you would use before, say, labiodentals like F or V. So in a word like symphony, symphony, that would be your M there. But we won't necessarily focus on that. That's more of an advanced phonological thing. So the M in match is your bilabial nasal stop. The N would be your alveolar nasal stop. And the N would be your velar nasal stop. So this is the same place that K and G are made. So G, N, G, N. You can feel they're in the same spot. So these are nasals, redirected through the nasal cavity. The last consonant we're going to talk about, the last consonant type, are liquids. And this has continuous airflow, but there's no turbulence. So a word like light, light, compare that to s, light. There's way more airflow through the sides of the tongue to make light. And this, of course, is the L sound. There's another type of L we have in English that we usually don't introduce until phonology but I want to introduce it to you because you will, you will feel a difference for sure. And that's in the word feel. So in this case, your O in light is alveolar. So you can feel it at the same places, light or light and D feel very similar. But in feel, you still have that alveolar part to it, feel, but the back of your tongue is curling up a little bit. Well, I shouldn't say curling, it's moving up a little bit. So this is what is called a velarized L. So feel and light. And depending on the position in the word, you will either have the L as in light or the L as in feel. This is typically called a light L in light. And in feel, this is called a dark L. So at the ends of words, we get the dark L. And at the beginning and middle of words, we get the light L. Finally, the last liquid is ripe. That's the R sound in English. And the symbol is an upside down R, R, ripe. And this is an alveolar. So we need slightly more terminology to distinguish between L and R because they're both alveolar liquids. So R is called an alveolar, uh, sorry, an alveolar rhotic liquid, while the O in light is considered an alveolar lateral liquid. So lateral meaning the air is going through the sides of the tongue, and in rhotic it kind of just describes the tongue curling. So r, r. There is quite a few steps to make the r sound. In a more difficult phonetics course, you'd go over those steps, but you can feel r. There's some tongue curling in the front. The back of the tongue is moving more towards the pharynx, so that's closer down towards the larynx, uh, and your tongue r and o r. Er feels a little bit further back, but I can assure you it's in the same spot as the ul. But thanks to the tongue curling, it feels a little bit further back in the mouth. So those are pretty much all the types of sounds you learn in an intro course. But I want to introduce one more because it's really important for transcription when hearing words, and that's the flap. So the flap is when two articulators briefly strike together. So the these are all examples of the alveolar flap. So this is alveolar. And this makes the the sound, like in butter, butter, or ladder, or kidding. So when we say butter, if you're a speaker of British English, you will say butter, butter. You will make that T sound. If you're speaking in Canadian or uh, US English, American English, Instead, you have this sound that isn't quite a T, it's not quite a D, it's just this very street, brief strike against the roof of your mouth. Butter, ladder, kidding, the, 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 the. If you know a language like Japanese, for instance, if you know a symbol like ra or ra, if you're an English speaker trying to pronounce it and reading it, you'll go ra, but the correct Japanese pronunciation would be something like la, la, 
da. And that da in Japanese RA is the same sound as in butter. So butter, ba da, 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 da. So if you know some Japanese, that might help you hear the sound. But uh, usually there's rules for understanding where flaps come. Butter, ladder, kidding. It'll always be between usually two vowels. The first one will be slightly louder than the second one. So kidding, ladder, butter, and then you get that flap. We'll have some practice with it in a few slides. Okay, so those are all the manners of articulation. And I know this is a ton of information to get at once. Uh, so definitely go through the video multiple times if you need to. Practice makes perfect, honestly. So the last thing we talk about is glottal state. And this is about your vocal folds. Normally this is introduced first, but I like to introduce it last just because it's a nice, easy thing to wrap up the entire chart of phonetic consonants. And this just talks about the vocal fold vibration. So when you make sounds, you can put your hands around your throat. Be careful not to choke yourself. We don't want anyone dying at home here. Uh, and when you make sounds, you can feel vibrations or you can feel no vibrations. So I like to check it with s and z. So with s, there's no vibrations, but with z, there are vibrations. In fact, vowels will always be vibrations. Now, when we take a look between p and b, p and b, the sounds are really identical. The only difference between the two sounds is that in p, you have no vibrations. So this is what's called a voiceless sound. And in b, you have vibrations. So this is called a voice sound. That's the only difference between these two sounds in map and in butter, b and p. It's just the difference between the vocal fold vibration. So the diagram on the right shows what is called, well, essentially your larynx. It shows the glottis and the vocal folds. So this is an example of a voiceless glottis. And you can see this because the glottis is open, the vocal folds are spread apart, they look kind of loose. So what would a voice sound look like in your vocal folds? Well, if we just cover it up, uh, it would be much more tightly closed. So we'd probably see some more black space like this. And then we'd also see some vibrations on these. And these are very hard to draw the vibrations, but imagine these are your vocal folds there. You'd see some vibrations. These little parts at the bottom would also be slightly more close together. And that would cause a voiced sound. So the difference between voice and voiceless is just basically how tight the vocal folds are. Then when air flows from your lungs all the way up through your larynx into your oral cavity, depending on how tight it is, will determine how much vibration there is, and that'll cause the voicing. So given that, here's the IPA for English. And as you can see, this chart is so much more friendly without all of the other sounds. One thing I want to point out, and I've really doctored this chart, so if I erase anything, this is going to turn into a, into a total disaster. But if you take a look at the columns here, you can go over all the things we talked about in this video. So all the sounds we talked about are laid out in a nice chart. Uh, the term plosive is sometimes used with the word stop. We use stop instead of plosive. Uh, nasals are, of course, nasal stops. But you can see that they're grouped together based on their place as well as their manner. The only thing we have to note here is that the voiceless sounds and the voice sounds will occur in groups of two. If it's on the left side, so let's say it's on this side, then it is voiceless. If it's on the right side, then it would be voiced. So b and m are voiced, and p is voiceless. If we take a look at these two, the theta is voiceless, the th is voiced. Uh, something like er and ol, these will always be voiced. We haven't covered the palatal glide yet, but that is also voiced. And of course, we have voice sounds here, here. The tap is always voiced. But you can see in the groups of two, the right side will be voiced, and the left side will be voiceless. So that also means that the h is voiceless and the glottal stop is voiceless. OK, so now that we've gone over so much, let's try to transcribe the consonants in these words using the symbols. So I'm going to say the word, and then you can pause the video. You can try to write out the consonants, and then I'll do the answers. So the first one, ship. Don't worry about the vowels. Just worry about the consonants. Ship. So I hear a sh, sh 
for the first sound in ship, and the last sound is the p, so ship. Okay, when we do these in full words, so when we write the vowels, if I were to write the full word with the vowels, we just do it in one set of square brackets, it's just to signal that we mean sounds. But because we're just doing the consonants, I'm just doing them in individual brackets. Okay, final. Final. Well, we have a f at the beginning, final, null, I hear an n, and final, final. What's your L doing in the back? So this is a dark L, final. You can feel your tongue in the back going up just a little bit, final. If you wrote it with just the regular L, that's also fine, because that is something you would probably do in phonology and not in intro phonetics. Okay, the next one, thong, thong. I hear a theta at the beginning, thong, the voiceless interdental fricative. Ah, mm, mm, mm. You remember this? This is our velar nasal. Mm, mm. Usually in English, it's represented by the N and the G. Mm. Okay, finally, the last word. Total. Total. Okay, listen, listen to the middle sound there. Total. Okay, the first one I hear a t for total. The last sound is going to be a velarized L as well. It's occurring at the end of the word. But that middle sound, total, total, that's our flap. So in my dialect of English, that is a flap, total. If you're a British English speaker, you would say total, total. And... Uh, I think that would be the two variations you would have. I don't think anyone would say to'ol. Actually, I could think of maybe one person in my life who might say to'ol, to'ol, in which case you'd have the glottal stop. Okay, so that's some practice with transcribing consonants. The next thing we want to practice, which is something we didn't really cover in the video, are descriptions. So with every sound, you can give it a description based on the voicing, the place, and the manner. And if you include those three, you have a description for a sound. So for instance, a t, t is voiceless, it is alveolar, and it is a stop. So we call this a voiceless alveolar stop. Now you can pause the video and you can try the rest, or I can just run you through it. It's up to you. So the ul, well, ul is a voiced sound. It is an alveolar sound. And I told you it was a liquid, but what type of liquid did I tell you? It was a lateral liquid. So we could call ul the voiced alveolar lateral liquid, and that would describe this sound. Okay, mm. All, all nasals are voiced. Mm. You can feel it in your throat. Mm. So this is a voiced velar nasal stop. Now, depending on the course you're in, sometimes we omit the word stop. So you don't have to put the word stop in there, but for completion's sake, I will say it's a nasal stop. And finally, f, f as in feel. So f is voiceless. It is labiodental, so it uses one lip and one tooth, or maybe two teeth. F, labiodental, and this is a fricative. So we could call this the voiceless labiodental fricative. Okay, so these are descriptions. So for every single symbol in the IPA, we can give it a description. So that's it for consonants. You now know the consonants of English. In the next video, we'll work on vowels. And believe me, there's a lot of vowels in English. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I will get to you as quickly as I can.